I want us to turn this morning, we're going to turn to Luke 3 first. Luke 3, and then I want you to be in Mark chapter number 1. But for those of you that really want to follow everything, you can go to Matthew chapter number 3. It's Luke 3, Mark 1, and Matthew chapter number 3. Um, these three passages record the first appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ since he was seen in the temple at the age of 12 in, in Luke chapter number 2 that we took a look at a few weeks back. All we know of the approximately 18 years of his life between ages 12 and 30 are summed up in Luke 2, 52, that when, and where it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And based on that verse, we can surmise that the silent years, those 18 silent years of Jesus Christ were years of mental, physical, and spiritual preparation for His work as Messiah and Savior. Now, the main uh, part of our scripture is going to be in Mark chapter 1. We'll be in Mark 1 more than we will be anywhere. But I want to read Luke um, chapter 3, verse 21 and 22 first because it has uh, something that I really never noticed before. Why I never noticed it, I don't know. I just didn't, okay? But in verse number 21, Luke 3, 21, says, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying. You ever seen that? And praying. Okay? The heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, and thee I am well pleased. All the many times that I've read through the, the Bible, read through that scripture, I, I had never noticed the, this, this account speaks of Jesus praying as he comes up out of the water. The other two accounts do not mention it, but uh, Dr. Luke does. Um, we look at Mark chapter number uh, 1, and we'll read our text for this morning. Mark chapter number 1. <clears throat> and we're going to pick up in verse number 9. It says, And it came to pass in those days, and those days is referring to when John the Baptist was baptizing out in the wilderness. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. So uh, in Mark 9 we're told that Jesus came in those days, and as I said, that refers to the days of John the Baptist's ministry that we saw last week, and uh, we, we, this is at the tail end of John the Baptist's ministry. So why did you, Jesus choose this particular time to make his true identity and mission known to men? I mean, this was the time that was selected. Christ came then because the time was right. You know that our Lord does everything in a timing. Man. There's a time for everything. Mm -hmm. Everything about Christ was carefully planned. It was carefully prophesied. And it was fulfilled. John the Baptist had blazed the trail as a forerunner of our Lord, preparing the hearts of folks and uh, praise the Lord for his ministry. John the Baptist's crowds, we know, were large and his ministry was at its peak at this point. And John had almost completed the work that he was called to do with the exception of one thing. And we're going to read about that and we'll be over in John chapter number 1 a little later also. And we'll see that when we come over there. The one thing that was missing was his baptizing of Jesus. Um, the Lord had told, uh, the, told John the Baptist that, uh, how he would recognize the Christ. But primarily, Christ came at this time because this was his heavenly Father's appointed time for his Son to be revealed. Now, by the way, Jesus coming again will be at the heavenly Father's discretion too. Amen. It's going to happen in his time, 
not in our time, okay? I pray that he does come in my time, but he's going to come when, when the Heavenly Father tells him it's time, my son. Now, the next phrase there in, in Mark 1, verse 9, says Jesus came. Mark 1, verse 9. Came to pass in those days, Jesus came. When, you, when Christ made his public appearance there on the banks of the Jordan River, it was at that moment that he began his earthly ministry. And ever since Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, mankind had been looking for the promised seed of the woman and uh, the Redeemer who would come and reconcile mankind to God. That's what was needed. Every person who had ever lived up to that day was just another soul in need of a Savior. Humanity had never been able to produce anyone who could deliver mankind from his lost condition because we all are in sin. But the virgin-born Son of God had no sin and did no sin. Amen. The day that Jesus Christ came to be baptized, things changed. From the time of his baptism until his death, burial, and resurrection... He had a profound impact on those that he ministered to. And we read about that in the Gospels, don't we? We know the profound impact that Jesus had. Today we're going to look at the verses uh, here and consider the events surrounding the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see some great blessings here in these verses as well as some interesting truths. I already shared one inter interesting truth that Jesus prayed when he came up out of the water. And uh, first of all, this morning, we see the appearance of the Son. Uh, let's read verse 9 again. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. Again, let's understand that this is the first recorded appearance of Jesus Christ in approximately 18 years. From the time he was 12... He was, the, the scripture tells us in Luke that he was about 30 years of age at this particular time. And we see that when he appeared, um, he, uh, he came to John the Baptist to be baptized by John. Now we saw in our last message uh, last week relating to John's ministry that his baptism was the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. You see that in Mark 1 verse 4 there. And in other words, uh, well, the people who came to John were publicly confessing their sins and submitting to baptism as a symbol and testimony of the fact that they had repented. They had changed their life. They were no longer going to go in the old direction they were going. They wanted to prepare for the coming of Messiah. So why was Jesus, the perfect, sinless Son of God, baptized? When Jesus came to John for baptism, Matthew tells us that John uh, at first refused to baptize the Lord. And this is where we're going to look at uh, a few passages here in Matthew 3. Matthew 3, verse number 13. Hold your place there in Mark. We're coming back to Mark, okay? But in Matthew 3, verse number 13, it says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to, to, uh, uh, unto Jordan to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, or let it be, let it be now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So, John and Jesus, we know, were cousins. And uh, they were separated by a period of, of only six months in age, John being uh, six months older than Jesus. John, no doubt, knew the kind of life that Jesus lived. He knew John growing up. And John knew that if anyone was holy, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. But in Matthew 13, 15, Jesus said, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And that phrase, to fulfill all righteousness, means that Jesus was baptized to obey His heavenly Father. To obey His heavenly Father. In other words, God was working through John the Baptist in those days 
And Jesus wanted to identify himself with everything that was of the Father. Jesus did not come to John to confess any sins or to be baptized to signify his repentance because Jesus had no sin that he needed to be uh, repenting of. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that he was the one that knew no sin. 1 Peter 2.22 says that he did no sin. And we know, looking at the life of Christ from the Scriptures, that, that, that those two things are true. Now, so the question remains, so why was Jesus baptized? Because that seems to be very confusing, right? Seems to be very confusing. Well, let me share with you a few reasons. First of all, Jesus appeared in declar declaration. Okay, Jesus appeared in declaration. When Jesus presented himself for baptism, he was making a public declaration of some important facts. Number one, Jesus was baptized to identify with John the Baptist's ministry. What John was doing was of God. Jesus came to John to place his divine seal on what John had been saying. John had been preaching to the people this message. Uh, the kingdom of God is at hand and the Messiah is coming. I mean, in so many words, that's what he was telling them. And Jesus came to be baptized of John to say to John, to John and the people, I am the Messiah. Growing up, he knew the character of Jesus, but he may not necessarily know that Jesus was the Messiah. He probably had, had his uh, uh, ideas about that. And uh, that, that's why he re was refusing to baptize the Lord Jesus Christ initially. Uh, so Jesus baptized to identify with John the Baptist's ministry. Secondly, Jesus was baptized so that John would know indeed that Jesus is the Messiah. Now this is where I will have you turn to the Gospel of John and chapter number 1. Gospel of John and chapter number 1. And I want us to take a look here uh, in verse, verse number 30. <clears throat> well, let's back at verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. In verse 30 he said, This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man who is preferred before me. For he was before me. That's part of what John the Baptist's preaching was. Um, he was revealing the Messiah. And verse 31, he says, And I knew him not. That's what makes me think that he wasn't for sure. He had, he had inkling, but he didn't know for sure. But he said, I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I, coming, am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So. We see that Jesus' uh, baptism was a declaration that he was the one that John was preaching about. A third thing, John was baptized to signal the beginning of, uh, Jesus was baptized to signal the beginning of his public ministry. His, his public ministry. So the baptism of, of, of the Christ was a public declaration that he was, in fact, the promised Messiah and that he was the Savior sent to reconcile man to God. He was and still is the only way to God. You're not going to get to God except through Jesus Christ. John 14, 16, Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Peter, as he preached in Acts 4, 12, says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus had one son. Jesus was his name. I mean, God had one son. Jesus was his name. And he came to give his life a ransom for sin. Another thing is that not only did Jesus appear 
in declaration, but Jesus appeared in dedication. In dedication. In His baptism, Jesus was willingly and publicly accepting the mission that He had been given uh, by His Heavenly Father. What was that mission? To come to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19.10 Jesus had entered the world for the sole purpose of carrying out God's plan of redemption, to redeem sinners. Jesus came to give His life on the cross as a ransom for sin. And He said that in Mark chapter number 10 and verse 45. So Jesus left the younger times of obscurity when we don't really know what was going on during those 18 years of His growing up. He, he left those younger times to begin His public mission and to seek, that public mission was to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus appeared in declaration. He appeared in dedication. And then we see, thirdly, Jesus appeared in demonstration. The baptism of Jesus also served to allow him to identify with the very people he came to save. Amen. He came to save, he came to save sinners. And those who came to John for baptism were looking for a new life. They were looking for forgiveness of their sins and for a relationship with God. Jesus Christ came to give those very things to lost people. He was born in a human body so that He might live among us and die for us. He was baptized to identify with us. His baptism identified Him with Adam's fallen race, which all of us are part of. He came to save Adam's fallen race. And He wanted to identify with us because He was taking our punishment. He wanted to identify with us. His baptism also pictured his own death, burial, and resurrection for us all. When Jesus submitted to John's baptism, he was picturing what would happen someday. When, when we, the reason why we baptize folks is because not only uh, we, we've been told to, to baptize that in uh, those that come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, as their Savior, that we're commanded to not only win them, but to baptize them and teach them to do the same things that we do. Amen. But uh, we know that Christ would, would enter death on the cross and He would rise again in the resurrection. He knew that He was heading toward a baptism called death. And it was a picture of the baptism of death that He was going to identify with there. In fact, Luke 12, verse, verse 50, Jesus said, But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and, and how I am straightened till it be accomplished. He was talking about the baptism of death, being identified with death. He took our death. He had identified with us in that death. Amen. He took it for us. So by His baptism, Jesus Christ was demonstrating His resolve, His solemn resolve to lay down His life on the cross for our sins. Thank God that He came for us. Amen. Uh, we were doomed and headed for hell. And we could not save ourselves, and no one else could save us. And Jesus left the glories of heaven, and uh, He came to live and to die in this cruel world, identifying Himself with us so that, that we might be saved. Uh, let me have you turn to Hebrews chapter number 2 for just a minute. And we see it talks about Him partaking of flesh like us, and the, the reason for that is Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2 and verse number 14. We're going to read down through verse 17. Hebrews 2 verse 14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. That's what we have. We, we all have are partakers of flesh and blood. He, speaking to Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, like us, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation uh, for the sins of the people. And by the way, Jesus uh, was also setting an example for 
his people. If Jesus so needed to be baptized to signal the beginning of his new ministry, he expects us to be baptized to show our new identification with him, that we have died to our sins through him and been raised to walk in newness of life through the, the resurrected life that he has. So we see the appearance uh, of the Son. Second thing we see, we see the anointing by the Spirit back in, back in Mark. I think we're done turning toward this morning. But back in Mark chapter number 1, and let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at verse number ten. It says, "In straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open." And here's where we want, and the Spirit, like a dove, descending upon him. We see the anointing by the Spirit there in Mark one verse ten. When Jesus was baptized, a strange thing happened. Mark tells us that the, the heavens open. Luke tells us that when he came up out of the water, he prayed. We're not, we're not given the words what that prayer was, but the Spirit in a visible form at that time came and descended on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we need to take a moment to consider the Holy Spirit and what he did in the life of Jesus. These verses help us glean a little understanding of their relationship. Of course, we know that they're inseparable, right? <laughs> I mean, you've got a holy trinity. It's one God. We, we don't Amen. serve three gods. We serve one God that's manifested in three persons. But we see uh, a picture of sacrifice. When, 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 the, when the Spirit came in the form of a dove here, understand that the dove, dove was the offering for the poor man. You can find that in Leviticus 5, verse 17. In fact, you can also find it in Luke 2, 24, when two turtle doves were uh, the offering given by Mary and Joseph when they presented Jesus as a baby. They were poor, and uh, their offering was two turtle doves. In the minds of people, doves were associated with sacrifice. Thus, when Jesus came into this world, he came to, to live a life of self-sacrifice, he did not come to live for himself. He came to live and to die for others. The Spirit of God anointed Jesus for a life of self-sacrifice. Also understand that doves uh, are birds associated with peace, and gentleness, and humility. And these were all attributes that marked the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, weren't they? They were. And uh, don't forget that Jesus Christ was and is God in human flesh. Uh, he did not enter this world as a man of war. Now, there were some in, in Israel that were hoping that's what he entered for. They wanted him to take on the Roman Empire, to lead them in battle against the Roman Empire, and to, to save them uh, in that manner of way. But that's not the salvation he came for the first time. He came to save man's soul. And uh, he came as the Prince of Peace that, that first time, according to Isaiah 9, verse 6. He could have come, uh, he could have come to destroy the world and condemn sinners. Instead, he came to die on the cross so that he might convert sinners. He, he could, could have called fire down from heaven to incinerate all the enemies of God. Uh, but instead, he absorbed the very judgment of God's wrath in himself on the cross so that sinners could be saved. And when the Spirit of God anointed Jesus, he anointed him for a life of self-sacrifice. So we see a picture of sacrifice. Secondly, we see a picture, we see a preparation for service. A preparation for service. We may wonder why Jesus, who is was and is God in the flesh, needed the Holy Spirit anointing. Did he not already possess all the power of the Godhead? We told that he, we're told that he, he did in Colossians 2 and verse number 9. In him uh, dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Was he not God in the flesh? We know that he was. He is the Emmanuel that is spoken of in Matthew 1 verse 23, which quotes out of the book of Isaiah that he would be coming and being the Emmanuel, God with us. Was he not the creator of the universe incarn <laughs> incarnate? Yes, he was. Jesus created all that we see, uh, 
Paul said in Colossians 1, verse 16 to 17, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, uh, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things are created by Him and for Him. So why did Jesus need the Spirit's anointing? Well, Jesus needed the Spirit's anointing because He did not come into this world to live as God. He came into this world to live as a man. He came to live as a man. While he, while he was here on the earth, Jesus laid aside His glory and the independent use of His divine powers. And he, 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 uh, what He did is He depended upon His Heavenly Father. And uh, I'm not going to turn there to Philippians 2, verses 5 through, 8, 5 through 8, but you can read about it there. How He humbled Himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And because he did that, the Father has exalted him. So, so he needed the anointing of the Holy Spirit to accomplish that. But we know that they were inseparable anyway. Amen? Amen. They were inseparable anyway. Everything that Jesus did, he did as a Spirit-anointed and Spirit-filled man. I think it was really basically for our purpose that that dove came down. It was for John the Baptist's purpose too, what we read in, in John chapter 1. It was for him to know... This is the Messiah. And it's for us to know, hey, he's anointed. He, he's a he's spirit-filled, uh, anointed uh, man. And as a spirit-filled man, he lived a perfect life. He satisfied the demands of God's law. He perfectly kept every rule and regulation. Then as man, he went to the cross to die so that he could shed his innocent blood, his perfect blood, as the atonement for your sin and for mine. Our sin. That's the reason he went to Calvary. If Jesus accomplished his Father's will as a Spirit-filled man, how much more do we need to live Spirit-filled lives ourselves in order to accomplish God's will for our lives? That's the only way you're going to ever be able to accomplish God's will for your life. It's not only have the Spirit of God living inside that comes at the point of salvation, but also to be filled with the Spirit. Amen. And that comes as we surrender to the Spirit's presence in our lives. So the anointing by the Holy Spirit was not only a picture of sacrifice and a preparation for service, but we see that it was a perfection of uh, the Scriptures, a perfection of the Scriptures. The Spirit came on Jesus to fulfill the ancient prophecies concerning the Messiah, the Old Testament prophets said that Messiah would be a spirit-filled man. It says that in Isaiah 11:2, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And also when Jesus uh, uh, preached his first message after, going, uh, after being uh, 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 announced at his baptism, after his baptism, he, he was... In the, in the wilderness, being tempted by Satan, but then he comes out, he goes to his hometown synagogue, and he preaches the first message. He's given a, an area to read in the book of Isaiah, and what he was reading was Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2, and, and we read in Luke 4, 18, Jesus said, this is being fulfilled in your eyes, and it was, and through him. And it, it talks about the, the filling, the Spirit of, of, the, of the Lord resting upon him. So when the events of Jesus' baptism occurred, the Jews should have recognized these signs as a fulfillment of the prophecies connected to the Messiah. They should have, but they didn't. We see uh, the appearance of the Son. We see the anointing by the Spirit. We see the approval of the Father. The approval of the Father. There in Mark 1, verse number 11, And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, that might have you shaking in your boots if you were standing around hearing that. Amen. Amen. Uh, we see the approval of the Father. When Jesus was baptized, not only did the Spirit descend upon Him, but there was also that voice of the Heavenly Father coming out of heaven, voicing His approval of Jesus and identifying Jesus as His Son. The word translated there, Thou, we says. Yeah, when he says, Thou art my beloved son, that word thou means thou and thou alone. Okay? And then uh, this identifies Jesus as the only begotten son. 
And the word for art there says that thou art my beloved son, and uh, uh, thou art my beloved son. Uh, that word art means are and always have men, in the tense of it. Jesus did not become pleasing to the Father just because he got baptized. Jesus had been eternally pleasing to the Father. And there was, had never been an instant when he had not been pleasing to his Father. He was just continuing to do what the Father sent him to do. The word beloved indicates the special inseparable bond of love that exists between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen? You can't, you can't separate it. You say, well, I don't understand that Trinity stuff. Well, you, you're not asked to, to, to understand it. You're asked to just believe it. Amen? We're asked to believe it. And let's consider this pronouncement by the Father as he uh, watched the baptism of his son. His father was expressing his approval of the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Three things, and we'll be done here. First of all, it was a public approval. It was a public approval. The father was letting John the Baptist and everyone else who heard him speak know that, that he was pleased with his son Jesus. He was placing his divine seal of approval upon the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this would not be the last time that the Father would speak to let men know that Jesus had his approval. On the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, verse 5, later in the ministry of Jesus, God said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. When the Father says that He is pleased and the Son, He is saying a lot. Pleased means to find pleasure in. To find pleasure. For, for, thousands, uh, for 4,000 years, God had been looking down on humanity. And all He saw uh, when He looked down on humanity was sin and failure and weakness of earth's inhabitants. When He looked at Jesus, He saw holiness, perfection, and strength. God spoke to let the world know that His Son and His Son's ministry had His seal of approval. Now, it was a public approval. Not only that, it was a personal approval. A personal approval. When, when the Heavenly Father spoke that day, He was also speaking for the benefit of the Son. For 30 years, the Heavenly Father had been watching Jesus as He grew and matured into a man, humanly speaking. Now, after 30 years of observation, His Heavenly Father gives His assessment on the earthly life of Jesus. He looked at Him and says, I am well pleased. I am well pleased. Didn't you like when you pleased your Father? I mean, we, like our, we liked it when our fathers were pleased. And you want to keep Daddy happy, right? Well, Jesus pleased His Heavenly Father. It was a public approval. It was a personal approval. And then last of all, it was a profound approval approval a profound approval when the heavenly father pronounced his approval of his son he was also voicing his approval for all those who would be in his son by grace through faith those of us that are saved this morning those of us that through faith by grace through faith we have received the lord jesus christ as our savior you know that the lord is pleased with jesus in us the only one that, that's going to please the Father is the Son. And that's why we need to be in the Son. Because if you're not in the Son, you can't please the Father. <laughs> when a person is saved, the righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed to them, according to Romans 4, verses 22 to 24. I'm not going to take time to read that. Romans 4, 22 to 24. In other words, when the Heavenly Father looks upon those who are redeemed, He does not see our vile sins and our wicked ways. He sees His Son and His holiness. He looked at us as we are justified as just as if we never sinned. Amen. So I don't understand that. You don't have to understand. You just need to believe it. <laughs> God, the Lord said it, and we, need to, we just believe it. How is this possible? How is it possible? Because when God saves us, listen, He justifies us too. That is, He puts our sins away from us forever. He declares us to be righteous, and when He sees us, He does not see our wretchedness, and we are wretched in and of ourselves. He sees Christ's righteousness, 
having been applied to our soul. And that is only true if you're in Jesus. In Him, there is no condemnation. We're going to look at that tonight. In Him, there is no condemnation, according to Romans 8, 1. In Him, there is salvation, according to John 3, 16. In Him, there is new creature, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. In Him, there is eternal life, according to John 10, verse 28. And in Him, there is acceptance, according to John 6, 37. In Him, there is hope, there is help, and there is a home in heaven. The question is, are you in Him? Are you in Him? If not, you need to be, and you can be, if you will come today. Uh, many things took place the day that Jesus Christ was baptized by John and Jordan. The greatest thing was the beginning of a ministry that would end with Jesus on the cross, dying for our sins, and then getting up out of that grave on the third day after He was buried. Thank God for the life He lived and lives and the ministry He fulfilled and continues to fulfill, amen, and the gift that He gave us, the gift of eternal life. Are you living your life under the control of the Holy Spirit? Or do you need to ask God to cleanse your vessel so that He can fill you today? This morning, the uh, invitations are very simple. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, please come. And uh, because of my physical condition, I'll have you just come sit on the front pew and we'll get somebody to, to, to take you apart in private and show you how you can be saved this morning. I don't want anybody feeling uncomfortable with me uh, having uh, the, the issues, uh, the sinus issues, uh, thinking that I'm going to be giving you something. But if you'll come just sit on the front, front pew, that tells me that you, you know your need of salvation. You want to get saved today. The altars are open. If you uh, are not living your life under the control of the Holy Spirit of God, you need to come and ask the Lord to uh, cleanse you and so that uh, you can be filled with this Holy Spirit today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ as he began his ministry there and, and all of the uh, things that, uh, wonderful things that are, are, are shown through Scripture of, of why this took place and, uh, Lord, how it took place. What a blessing it is to understand and know that Jesus is your Son. He's your only begotten Son. I need He came for our benefit. And, Lord, it's a wonderful to know you as our Savior and to be in Christ because we have so much by being in Christ. Lord, if there's one that's not in Christ, help him to come. Get in before it's everlasting too late. And we pray that, Lord, we as believers will seek to live our lives uh, uh, spirit-filled. That's your intent for us. Uh, we, we are spirit indwelt because we don't have the spirit living within, then we're not one of yours. But all that are yours have the Holy Spirit living within, but we must surrender to the Holy Spirit, live our lives accordingly. Have your way in the lives of believers today too as well. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.